how do you think this is going to end here? Someone's run off with the clicker for the slides, so I think this might be a bit easier. Apologies if I'm slow. I've been up till 2 a.m. working on a rat trial. Some of the problems working on nocturnal species. Um, but I'll do my best to keep my energy levels up. Um, what I thought I'd talk about today is just a bit of a brief background about what are the issues with some of the current control tools, which I'm probably preaching to the converted here, because a lot of you guys will probably know what the limitations are. Um, and I'm going to talk about a lot of work we're now doing in AI, so using artificial intelligence in pest control and the new tools we're developing there. Um, I'm going to also touch briefly on some of the work on new species specific toxicants, so that's new toxins that are likely to come out in the immediate future. Um, and then I'm going to touch on gene drive. I know Andrew Field is also going to touch on gene drive, so I might make my, my talk about gene drive a little bit quick so you don't have to hear it twice. Um, okay, so um, current control tools. I think one thing that I'd like to say first the tools that we use to control pests were designed for suppression on big landscape scales. So, DOT 200 boxes were never designed to eliminate pests from the area. Um, and the, one of the main things about the design, they were actually designed also to keep non-target pests out. So, in other words, they're heavily constrained in their design to try and stop kiwi, kaka, um, kiwi, any of those species trying to get into the traps, which means that their design is actually totally rubbish. Um, and if you're, you're pretty lucky if an animal goes in there. I always think I've got 20 years of videos of stokes sitting on top of traps, looking at traps, trying to dig in the back of traps, but very rarely videos of stokes going into traps. Um, that's a, another good example of a ferret at the bottom, walking up to a dock box, putting its head inside, going out and it's too high and turning around and leaving again. So we can try as much as we want to you, you, use new lures and things to try and get these pests in, but the designs themselves are pretty, pretty heavily constrained. Um, and uh, we also know that we've got this emerging issue with trap shyness, particularly in um, Stokes, where a lot of them just won't go into a, into a trap. Um, our current toxins are not great, they're not perfect, but they do the job some of the time. Um, but their limitations they're going to start being more and more limited, some of what we use now, in terms of actually being able to be uh, registered in New Zealand anymore. So that's why I'm going to talk about some of the new ones that are coming out. Um, and the reason we've been doing a lot of R&D on this sort of new tools and technologies is because we know that we can come up with better traps, better toxins, and overall solutions that are, that are safer and more efficient. Um, and the other thing is our limitations with pest monitoring. Again, we never designed this stuff for a lot of the, the situations that it's used in now. Um, these things are really cheap, and that's great, but they just give you a rough index of abundance of a, of a pest population, which isn't really what you want if you want to get pests to really low levels, or you want to do an ambitious eradication project. Putting out a tracking tunnel for one night isn't the best thing to do. Um, I spend a lot of time using tracking tunnels, Half the time they're just totally smeared and you can't see what was there, or a dog's pulled it out, or a possum's eaten it, or a rat has just refused to go into it, if I might be at. Um, so a lot of my work in the last 10, 15 years has been on automated surveillance and, and detection tools as well. So things that enable, that you can leave out in the environment, but that will um, update you remotely. So that's a nice lead into the next part of my talk, which is about how we're using AI to um, develop new traps and surveillance systems. Um, I work for a lot of engineers, and they use a lot of words I don't use, they don't want to do. Um, but what they like to stress is AI can be really great, but only if you use the right information. Um, I like to have AI They sent me the other day with someone has put in salmon in the river as their AI prompt for a picture. That's the kind of thing that if you don't use the right information, it will get really easily confused. Um, the other thing is AI 
can be very powerful, but it can also be really uh, power hungry. So if we want things we can use in the bush, we have to have solutions that make them long life, robust, and really power efficient. Um, and that has been part of the key of what we've worked on uh, for the last few years. So um, we started actually doing AI detection on pests before we went to, to kill traps, and this has been probably five or six years in the making. But the reason we wanted to look at AI for, for killing pests was it means we can totally remove any other uh, means that the, anything else the animal has to do. It doesn't have to stand on the trigger, it doesn't have to pull on a white bar, it doesn't have to go through a series of complicated battles to, to keep non targets out. So as soon as we use AI, the animal has to do nothing. It just needs to be there. Um, and of course, as soon as we use AI and train it to only target on pests, it doesn't matter what other native species that they own set their heads in because they're, they're totally safe. Um, the other thing I like about AI and our trap is I push it one button and I walk away. I hate dog traps as a passion. I still use them on my own land in the, in the Coromandel, but resetting them is just awful. Um, so pushing an on button is great for me and having the trap set itself um, much safer and, and easier. Um, so uh, the trap we've developed, well we reset it 100 times and then we stopped because we thought that's getting a bit silly to go beyond that. But basically it'll keep resetting as long as it's got batteries and it runs off AA batteries, rechargeables. So we were funded by a Predator Free 2050, so a big shout out to them to develop this trap. And if you're developing an AI, you need to spend a lot of time getting the data to feed into the trap to teach it what to do. So we spent about a year collecting all the AI data we needed on um, pest species. Um, I think, you know, 20,000 stoked images, for example. Um, and then after we did that, we actually had to prove that the trap would actually kill the target species super fast. There's a process you do have to go through in New Zealand to develop the trap. Um, we then did extensive non-target data collection. So, big shout out to Auckland Zoo who helped us all with that. So we put all our data collection devices in care enclosures. They thought it was great. They went in there and got peanuts out and hopped around and tried to destroy them. Um, and we went through a virus to write into anything that would be considered a non-target. And I'll come back to that. Where we're at, at the moment is we're field trialing the traps. So we're at the last little bit of the stage. Next year, we have to do what's called an AWAC trials. That's the animal welfare trials in New Zealand. You've got to go through before a trap goes on the market. And then the traps will be commercially available next year. Um, I'll just go over this really quick, but um, summarising the years with work on one slide. Um, we, the first, one of the first things we did was actually making sure the trap was super, super fast. So you can develop AI, but developing AI on board a, a device so the trap itself thinks is quite challenging because it has to be very, 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 very fast. So it can't spend time making a decision on the animal will be gone. So technically, it was a real challenge to be able to get a trap to think so super fast that it um, could make a decision while the animal was still there. But first time in any trap I've been involved with in 20 years, the possum one, the rat one, and the stoke one all passed straight away with a class A kill, which is the highest rating kill. It means an instant, an instant kill. The other thing we've got about AI is it can ensure the animal's in exactly the right place when the trap goes off. So it won't trigger on tails or paws or if the animal's turning, turning sideways or something. So from a humaneness perspective, it's, it's really great. Um, and after we did that last year, the animal ethics people said, yes, you can go ahead and test it in the field. Before we tested in the field, we did a huge amount of testing on non-target species. Um, hands, obviously, because everyone sticks their hand in a trap. Um, shoes, because you'd be surprised if you could go, is the trap working? We go like that. Um, there, there's, there's about 60 other species that we came up with a huge list and, and worked our way through. Um, some of them are probably unlikely to go in a trap, but uh, better to be safe than sorry. So uh, we currently have 100% accuracy in terms of the trap identifying pests versus 
anything else that's been trained on. And so we started doing field trials of the trap, uh, it must have been about three or four months ago. Um, this was an exciting, the first night that we did this. We, we, we can actually watch all this real time, which is a big thing these days. Um, so I had all the engineers on one video call, all live watching what was going on. Because they spend 
hours and hours and hours going through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of videos and pictures from camera traps, which are mainly false triggers, no matter how well we set them up to avoid false triggers. Um, they are, as I found in the last 12 months, have actually a really low detection rate, particularly for the smaller animals. Um, the work we've done on scopes, that's a, that's a picture I like to, to show the scope pictured on a, on a camera trap. Stokes can detect camera traps. We've got endless images and just sitting there looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> and I always get the road and people say, oh, I've put all these camera traps out to, to see if anything goes in my trap. And I'm like, well, you just get a picture of a Stokes sitting on the trap looking at it. <laughs> so they, they, they like words and clicks and they have a lot of background noise. Um, so in Australia, they, they've actually created a big problem where they, they use cameras to monitor feral cats taking baits and going into traps. The feral cats then associated cameras with uh, sickness or injury and taught their kittens to avoid cameras. So now they can't figure out how many cats are in the landscape because they've got this aversion behaviour to cameras. Um, so we were also funded by Premier Free um, to look at a new form of um, camera surveillance using AI. Um, so this system uses a thermal based trigger, but we got it working both daytime and nighttime. Most only work, <laughs> most only work at night. Um, and the big uh, issue with using thermal is making it low cost and low power. Um, but we've managed to take that. Um, and again, this is designed to be real time <coughs> AI, which sends you a notification of which pest species it is your phone, your computer, or whatever if you want to. We have a lure device that lasts for a year that we use with these cameras too, that you can see just at the bottom of that picture. So we spent a year developing the AI based on a whole lot of uh, pest species interactions. Some of it, the camera, so like that, that picture at the bottom is actually a mouse, but the AI is actually better at detecting things now than we are in pictures. So we were finding we were trying to ground truth it and we'd sit there and glance through the pictures and be like, no, there's nothing there. The AI would say, yes, there is. And it was always right. <laughs> so it's probably a bit smarter than <laughs> um, and, and of course, it picks, it picks up uh, of native species as well. Um, so it can be used for monitoring everything. Predator freedom just in the recent pests, but <coughs> it detects other species as well. Um, and the way we've got it working at the moment, it, it will send me a, a message or a user a message if it um, detects something and send you that accuracy at which it thinks it has detected that. So it's 98% sure that that's a possum, it's 93% sure that that's a, that's a rat. It also tells me the battery life of the camera, so if I need to go out and replace the batteries, I can do that. Um, we found that for mice and rats, it's about 100 times better at picking up rodents than uh, the traditional trail cameras are, so many, many times better. But what I've been surprised about is the number of cats and possums that it, that it picks up that trail cameras don't. So we did run a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so this, these cameras are going to be available next year. They just work on AI batteries again, if you change the AI. Um, and yeah, it can have AI if you need the AI. If you don't want the AI, you can just look at your pretty pictures on a visual dashboard and see what's going on. This is what my husband does at home because he's now got access to it. So we live in a lifestyle block. He sits in the house. If he sees a possum in the camera, he goes out and shoots it with the dogs. So also not great for this one. <laughs> Way more efficient. Um, one of the other uh, last one today I'll talk about quickly is um, our critic. So this was developed because the hepatologists at my work, so the people who work on on, on, um, on lizards and things, were like, hey, we don't have any technology for us. Can you make something work that we can that we can use? Um, and monitoring these small species is really hard. Um, because they're really cryptic, a lot of them run away at the same time as you're trying to manually search for them. Um, so we worked to develop what we call a little pit box. So it's a super lightweight little box 
It can be put out with or without a lure, and uh, it sends you instant notifications of what it detects. It can do AI in terms of saying, I detected a gecko or a skank or um, if it's really interesting visitors to some of these. We had a saddleback basically in one for a while. Um, we got stuck actually with them out on territory Martini during lockdown because we couldn't get back and pick them up. So we got some great six months worth of data that wasn't really planned. Um, but they last for months and months. Again, just on AI batteries and um, they're great for monitoring the probiotic monitoring. Little things respond fast to pest controls. But it's really engaging if people can see what, what's out there. Um, that's some other examples. It's a key to Oh, there's the saddleback who lived in the unit. Yeah. And then we was after the insects that had gone for the law. So we figured out that you could go. You could come and go to the unit and set out the insect. We've got some great pictures of them. Thank you, because we ended up having a meal or something. Um, so, yeah, that, that, this technology is actually available in two months' time. Um, and it's just going to be rented out, so if people want to use it, they can just rent a unit for two weeks, a month, or whatever, and return it, so they don't have to buy it. It's designed to be more cost-effective. I haven't talked about some of that other stuff, because there's too much there, but um, our credit solutions website does link to some of our other products, this communications devices, and um, and those, and uh, various other things on there as well. You want to go look. Um, but I will talk quickly about some of the emerging toxins. So I've got a bit of a background in toxicology as well. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about the ball mine, because this is the one anyone always wants to know about. Um, and I think it's really important to say that developing new toxins is really, really hard and really, really, really expensive, but it is definitely necessary. What we're using now, a lot of it was registered in the 60s. Um, so there's quite a high chance of secondary poisoning. Um, there's risks on targets, and the big, big issue which is causing most of these toxins to be banned around the world is the bioaccumulation, so the residues that are left behind. Um, and with the bans that are now going on in Europe, it's likely New Zealand will have to probably follow suit. Um, so there's been a bit of push to try and come up with new solutions so that we're not left without these various tools available. Um, so some of the new ones are designed to be non-residual toxins, so they're designed to be really fast acting, um, much safer and much more species specific. Those are some of those toxins that are aiming to do that, but I'm going to talk specifically about you know, born wine, just because of time. And I don't like saying that, it's just paraamino so we'll stick with that for that one. Um, now wine is actually really interesting because if you look into the background, Nobormai was designed as a, a heart treatment in humans. So they, um, they tested it on rats, and all the rats died. And they were like, okay, that's not going to work well, is it? <laughs> so um, it, it, ironically, it took a while later before someone went, well, that's very sick. Why did the rats die? Um, and they tried to develop it way back in the 60s, they found this out, but they could never get the rats to eat it. Big problem getting rats to eat it. So, um, then all these anticoagulants came on the market in the 60s and they went, oh, we don't need anything else now, we're, we're, we're sorted. So it kind of just dropped by the wayside. But the thing about the warm light, it is the most selective toxic known in mammals. It only works in rats. So there is basically no risk to anything else, including mice. But um, it's totally species specific. It's super fast acting, so time of death is 1 to 2 hours, which is way better than an anticoagulant, and not persistent in the environment at all. So it's got huge benefits. The issue is trying to get it to work. I said to one of my um, juniors, can you put a slide, write a slide on the ball my results? And she's done it. I didn't mean literally one, but she has done one. Um, but, so we've been working for the last few years and getting the ball my up and running again and back to market. That's been with Auckland Uni um, and Conovation. Um, and we have been able to crack it in the last few years and summarise all that. And one is that the pace bait 
is the lab and field trials is now 100% done, so it will go through the EPA and probably be registered for you soon. Um, the pallet bait, the hard bait, is going to come out from Norway rats, and then the aim will be that that pallet bait comes out of ship rats. The big market is never ship rats internationally, so it is hard to get funds with ship rats because no one else cares. They all want to kill Norway rats. Um, there's a picture of one of my team with dead rats in the ass. <laughs> it looks very happy if someone carrying on with dead rats. This is from one of the uh, field trials we've just run. We've, we went from 86% tracking to no tracking after the newborn wipe was out. So um, the aim is that the first, it should be commercially available next year, but it depends on the EPA and their decision and they are very, very strong. <coughs> Uh, the other thing about the bore that I, I always want to mention, everything you should always be for any toxin you're using, um, even if it's something that's species specific, always pre because you get a way, way, way higher knockdown rate than if you don't. Um, I can probably skip that one, but um, yes, hopefully we let you wrap that size. Um, but what we've shown is that this is going to be, that the bore is going to take off globally in the next 12 to 24 months. And the implications in New Zealand are pretty big, particularly if we can get to the point where we've got an aerial rat bait that is 100% rat specific. Um, it'll be really transformative for island eradications, where they're looking at rats that have significant non target issues. Um, and, and even for main main projects, it's going to be, it's going to be the next best thing, the next big thing. Moving to the further ahead, Everyone always asks me, what about a gene drive? Um, is it going to be the silver bullet? The answer is no, it's not going to be the silver bullet. Uh, I had someone else say to me the other day, oh, well, we don't need to fund anywhere for peace control because we'll just wait for gene drive to come out. It's <laughs> like, oh, what about that? Um, and I know Andrew's going to talk about gene drive, um, so I won't talk about it too much. I might take away some of the same. Um, and I won't go too much into the details of what gene editing is. So I just made it really simple up there. It's changing a DNA strand. So if we're talking about it for pest animals, the aim has been to do something that makes them infertile or so the word they use, oh, essential viability, that means die. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and there has been a big review done uh, by the Royal Society about options in terms of gene editing for, for pest control in New Zealand. But the weird thing about gene drive is there's a lot of public backlash and uncertainty about the use of this technology and there's a huge amount we don't know. So if you start mucking around with genes, we don't even know what some of those genes do. So the potential for unintended consequences is, is, is really quite high. I've just put two examples up. One for possums. Um, and this is one thing I think is a really important take home message. If we were to be able to use a gene drive on possums, we need to release 1 to 10% of the wild population, of those modified populations, back into the wild again. So I can just see turning up to you know, Joe Bloggs on his farm and say, Can we release a I know if I can not kill them for a while. Very challenging. And we can a lot of legal issues there as well. Um, Australia feels super concerned that we might develop a gene drive for possums because possums are protected over there. And all it takes is one grumpy farmer to try and, and, and in Australia to try and bring something in over there. Um, there are some issue, massive issues here about what we need to do about social acceptability of gene drive. Um, rats and stoats, <laughs> if I had to put a bet on it, I'd say gene drive for rats is probably going to happen, um, overseas first. I think there is some major issues though in terms of rats are actually really important in some ecosystems. Not in New Zealand, but in other countries they are. And, and there are some rat species that are native rat species that people don't want killed, but it's quite rats a tricky that can it, a gene drive could spread to, to other similar rat species, which then raises an issue in New Zealand about Kiori, which 
um, uh, are really culturally significant for some people in New Zealand. Um, same thing with stones. Stones, and I'll end too much with this, so I won't mind about too much. Um, stones are another important thing in, in, in some European countries as well. So, accidental release and spread of gene drive is a, is a really major concern. Um, the other thing is it's very likely that resistance to these gene drives will develop over time. Um, they were from, uh, and uh, the fourth point there is actually from, from Andrew, an optimistic scenario for, for stoats, it wouldn't start impacting the population for 60 years. I don't think we'll have any vitamins left by then. So we might get rid of the stoats, but it's pretty hard to to say, hey, this technology might work in 120 years. Let's just hold off doing any other control until then. So, not the silver bullet at the moment. Uh, last, lastly, <coughs> I just wanted to say that, that one of the things that's really important to talk about with any of this new tech, nothing works well on its own. So you can have a great track, but if you don't have a good bullet, it's kind of pointless. Um, the same thing in terms of a lot of the stuff is moving to new communication systems. If you want to have a really good detection device, you also need communication. So we've always kind of worked in this holistic space that there's a whole lot of technological advances that need to happen at the same time. And everyone always says to me, especially the media, is predator free 2050 going to happen? Is it possible? And I, I think it's not going to be one one thing that makes it happen, I think it's going to be a multitude of small incremental steps um, that will help us get there. But do I think it's possible? Well, hell yeah. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, and everyone went, oh, we're going to have cell phones the size of our watch. And we went, no, no. <laughs> and then, like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think we can, we can rule it out. Um, 